So every year for the past three years, I've made a video on this exact subject. Now this year I think is different because of what we've been seeing in the landscape as well as the fact that it's an anniversary year. And if I know one thing about Omega after years in this hobby, it's that Omega does not like to miss its anniversary, especially a 60th anniversary. They like that number a lot. So get ready for a talk around what is arguably my favorite variation of the Seamaster 300, a legend in the annals of mil-spec watch history, as well as the development of the professional dive watch. Let's dive in. This has been a very odd year for Omega so far. Apart from the Spyrate Seamaster that they unveiled with the new technology and all of that involved, we haven't seen anything from the brand. Bearing in mind that the Speedmaster was launched in the first quarter of this year, and we are approaching the six month mark, we haven't seen anything else. This is uncharacteristic of the brand. Because this time last year, prior to Watches and Wonders, they released an entire catalog. From the Seaweed Green Seamaster Professional, to the Planet Ocean Ultra Deep, and a new collection of 57 Speedmasters. As well as a whole new color range for Aqua Terrors. And I think it's safe to say that Omega went kind of mad last year with all of those launches. As well as the fact that they debuted the Moon Swatch, and the many controversies that surrounded that piece. And in eager anticipation, I think most of us were expecting the same thing. Just a week before Watches and Wonders, everyone was gearing up to see what they would give us, and they gave us nothing. I think the real beauty of that launch and the release of that amazing catalog of watches last year is that it shows that Omega can do their own thing on their own time. They don't need to adhere to any kind of timeline or time limit. And another great thing was it took so much attention away from the big brands and the big names. We were still talking about these releases during Watches and Wonders, and I think that might have been the desired effect they were going for. So in answering that big question about where is Omega, what are they doing, why haven't we seen anything new from them, well, they don't really have to do much, first off, but secondly, I think instead of putting a huge group of watches together in a certain slot, they are going to stagger them over the course of the year. So we might get six individual releases instead of five all at once and then one big release at the end of the year. I really like that format. As a content creator, it's great because it means it keeps us on our toes throughout the year. This leads on to today's subject nicely because we haven't seen anything from them. It allows us to speculate and also, I think, to believe that they have something good up their sleeves. They're obviously working on something and they're going to launch it pretty soon. 1963 was a very important year for the Seamaster 300, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. In 2021, just two years ago, we saw the Seamaster 300 arrive in a new configuration, far more heritage inspired. This current 300 pulls a lot of inspiration from the original CK2913 or the first you know, rated Seamaster for diving, but at the same time injects a few modern touches. And if we pull back the pages in history, it looks something a bit more linked to the 165.014, which was a transitional variation between the straight lug case Seamaster and the later professional case that we're going to talk about. But here's the funny thing about Omega compared to so many other brands today is that their anniversaries, their limited editions that they launch, those special edition pieces, they are some of the best. From the CK859 that we saw at the end of last year to the CK2998, to the Ultraman, the new Ed White 321, the third generation Snoopy. But you notice that through all of this, we don't see many specialist Seamasters. We see a lot of Speedmasters. I mean, that's their bread and butter, Omega and Speedmasters, it's like. But as far as the Seamaster collection goes, we might get a special edition Planet Ocean, something for the Olympics. The most recent 60th anniversary James Bond professional Seamaster though. Now we're talking. We could be so bold to say it's one of the best interpretations of a modern Seamaster professional that Omega has ever devised. And this is going back to the early 90s when it was introduced. This one has many nods to the Golden Eye original, but also manages to look forward. And personally, I would love to see this to be the future of Omega's sports watch line because it's so simple, it's tastefully done. And a few years back, another Seamaster that made a big splash was a part of the Trilogy Collection and all the history that pertains to these watches. Anyway, the 165.024, first released in 1963, but didn't really find its footing until 1966, 67, 
and I think a lot of us know why. It was essentially made to be a more advanced Seamaster 300, the true professional Seamaster, transitioning out of that polished straight lug case to a more professional case at a time where these watches were needed to be used in harsher settings where diving had evolved and had become more sophisticated, so the dive watches had to then adapt and change too. This was a really great time for sports dive watches and their development, which I'm sure most of you know. It was the golden age of their evolution. But before all of this happened, let's just step a few leagues back and talk about the history of British military dive watches. Very short history, but also something quite fascinating that a lot of people don't talk about with regards to the significance of the Seamaster 300 and the role it played in the development of future dive watches. I mean, this FXD probably wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the 300. Before the Navy selected the 300, they hadn't necessarily standardized the design of a dive watch just yet. Now, believe it or not, there are some great records around the watches that were issued before this. Models very unknown to the public, like the 6150 Rolex Explorer. An Explorer, tiny little watch given to naval divers in the early 50s. We're talking 1953. And these were the divers that wore brass helmets. You know, so they would strap these over their suits. Now, these watches were all recognized by the engraving of HS10 on the case backs. Super rare, small batch numbers. Now, soon after that, we saw the A6538, the original mill sub, a Rolex Submariner with a 6200 Submariner dial, basically an Explorer dial, but with a 6538 case, a big crown, very odd, very perplexing, but we started seeing a few small nuances like the circle T on the dial, and they were playing around with the idea of fixed spring bars at this stage. Unknown to a lot of people, the Seamaster 300 snuck into service, but wasn't necessarily used by the Navy at first. They were given to the RAF in small batch numbers to test their validity, their water resistance, and their ability, and this was right around the, the mid-60s, I would say 65. And the Ministry of Defense, the MOD, selected this watch because it fell under the DEF STAN, or the Defense Standard Code 66, being an instrument built for marine and naval applications. And in many ways, it's a watch that built on where the A6538 left off. And as most of us know, it then became the template for the development of the 5513, 14, and 17 Rolex Millsub. Now, what's quite controversial and not spoken about is that this Seamaster 300, before being given to the Navy and becoming a military dive watch, had so many of these small nuances already checked. The fully graduated bezel insert, the large plots on the dial, even the sword hands to some extent. So the great conspiracy around the professional Seamaster 300 is that it wasn't the MOD that informed their design. This watch, in fact, informed the MOD's direction of where the design of their dive watches would go. It's pretty cool. They would then go further and push the idea of fixed spring bars and include the circle T hallmark on the dial. The later evolution of this watch by 66, 67, we started seeing a big triangle at the 12 o'clock. The whole concept of fixed bars, the fully graduated bezel, the gladius sword hands, a lot of luminova, the arrowhead on the seconds hand, these were all very important components. This is where the love began. But I think the reason why the military chose this watch is first and foremost, that gorgeous professional liar lug case that has that integrated system to hide the crown and keep it protected. That's number one. Number two is the increase in knurling so that bezel turning is far easier. And the third, its presence. The watch is 42 millimeters in size, which was far bigger than the standardized size of the day. On the wrist, on the bare skin, over a wet suit, over a dry suit, so legible because of its size, but so practical to be used at the same time as an instrument. It's just perfect. Let's not forget, while all of this was going on, there was a huge contract opportunity to work with a specialist dive watch company, Comex, Compagnie Maritime de Expertise. Rolex, Omega, they submitted some amazing designs. The Ploprof was chosen for a period of time and the Seamaster was also submitted. So all of that history and backstory aside, what I'm trying to bring across is that this is such a significant dive watch in Omega's history, arguably the most significant. I mean, as a sports diver, it was one thing. As a professional watch, it was something else. The fact that it was also used in a military application is even better. It's the cherry on the cake. These aren't only beautiful and functional designs that had such a great impact on the development of the professional sports watch, but they're also icons in a sense. And taking all of that into account and the fact that it is its 60th anniversary this year, I do believe that we're going to see this watch. Now, the ways they could debut this watch, a one-to-one -one recreation of the original with slightly faded loom, very similar to the CK859, it could be seen as a special edition, 
possibly a limited edition. But then something even more exciting, since they are limiting their releases of watches by quite a long schedule, why not a full collection of Seamaster 300s in this format with two-tone, with different color variations, as well as one that is faithful to the original. From its design, its inspirations, its significance, and how it pushed the development of the dive watch, the Seamaster 300 in the professional case deserves to be given to us, and I just hope that Omega follows through. And look, I'll be the first to admit that I get more wrong than I do right, but sometimes things creep in. And judging by the 60th anniversary, the playbook, the development, and where we have arrived now, the fact that they paid tribute to the 57 model, and looking at the development of the Planet Ocean and how it has evolved from the 165.024, you know, I have given up hope in some ways, but then Omega always manages to surprise us. So, we wait and see. Is this one of the coolest dive watches ever made? Yes. Will Omega give us this watch? Yes. Will it be this year? I mean, now is the time, right? I'm in two minds about them giving us this watch, because I do think it's going to be a one-to-one -one recreation. But also, since it's going to be an anniversary and a limited edition, it's going to be made in small numbers, as well as the fact that it's going to reach that same kind of level as the Ed White, in a lot of ways, just for a different crowd. The thing is, it's going to be very expensive, and the fact that the watch climate has changed so much in the last six years. But it's a watch that deserves to come out. It's the natural successor. It shows the development of their dive watch. So we will be seeing it eventually, but until then... Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video, and I'll see you in the next one.